Today's topic is Milena, more precisely Milena Yesenska. And the reason for this is, well, an old Spanish television show from 1989. And now you're wondering, well, how does that connect? Well, let me explain. So a couple of months ago, I bought um, Fernando Arabal's Carta al General Franco, Letter to General Franco at some sort of, I don't know, second-hand shop. And I took a picture of the book and sent the image to a friend of mine in Spain, being like, hey, have you read it? What's your input? And he didn't say anything about the book. He just kind of like wrote back, wait, Arabal, you need to watch this. And he sent me a link of a recording of like an old Spanish television show in which you see nine men and their egos discuss um, millenarianism. So millenarianism is kind of this sort of belief in a perfect just society that will somehow establish itself after some grand uh, revolution. But the reason this kind of like piece of television is so infamous, supposedly in Spain, is because Arabal during the whole show is, and you can't really put it any other way, completely wasted. Or I don't know what he was on, it was the 80s, but he's just all over the place, kind of like gyrating on the coffee table in the middle of, uh, of, of the stage, shouting over the other participants, interrupting them, being like, you're an idiot, and this is all stupid. Anyway, but then at one moment he says the following. El milenarismo es decir de Milena, la mujer de Kafka. So basically in his inauguration he comes out with or comes up with this weird connection um, saying that, you know, millenarianism derives or comes from Milena Yesenska, the woman of Franz Kafka, uh, which is completely ridiculous, of course, but it elicits some sort of chuckles from the other guys in the room. And I was like, okay, I think this might have actually been the best part of this horrible video, so I'll give you that, Fernando. But then I thought, but wait, there is more, because, well, Fernando Arabal, as I just, you know, purchased the book, wrote a letter to Franco. And what did Kafka do to Milena and vice versa? Well, they wrote letters to each other, so voila, the magic happened. Uh, so yeah, this is what we're going to talk about today, the connection between these, these two letters, or the, well, there's not just two, there's many. Let's start with Fernando Arabal. So, Yes, um, I might not have given you, if you don't know anything about him, I might not have given you the best impression of him right now, but he's actually a very accomplished artist who did everything from literature to theatre to film and was very well connected with um, the world of artists everywhere, especially in Paris where he lived for quite a big chunk of his life. So he was born in 1932 and he was heavily impacted by the Spanish Civil War and also, of course, then the time of Franco in Spain. When the Civil War started, he was only four years old and his father was actually uh, prosecuted. He was put in prison and then kind of handed from one prison to the other until at some point, apparently, there was some sort of um, meltdown or that is implied and he was put into some sort of psychiatric unit from which he then escaped, uh, only to never be seen again. And I think that was that last station was in Burgos, if I remember correctly. So obviously this uh, heavily impacted the young uh, Arabal. And then, like, obviously the Spanish Civil War ends in 1939 and Franco, you know, is in power. So very quickly uh, Arabal decides that he will actually decamp to Paris and live in exile and that already happens like in the mid 50s when he's like okay I'm gone uh, this I cannot stay here in Spain under the circumstances that we have here. In exile in 1971 he decides to sit down and write an open letter to Franco which is this 
letter to Franco that uh, that I purchased. And it's actually a quite uh, fascinating read because he makes um, kind of comparisons between the Franco dictatorship and the Spanish Inquisition or the time of the Spanish Inquisition, which he says is one of the worst periods of Spanish history. Uh, he talks about, you know, how he feels cut off from, like, his homeland, from other artists in Spain. And he really kind of, like, tries to make Franco understand that, you know, what he's doing is just wrong. Now, of course, I don't think there was ever a reply to this to this letter. Uh, not that I know of. Uh, I don't think Franco is that sort of, or was that sort of person. But what did happen is that Franco did eventually die. And that was in 1975, when then Spain kind of started on its path of la transition and the change into kind of a more sort of democratic, um, like, way of being. Let's put it that way. Now let's have a brief look at the letters of Franz Kafka to Milena. Unfortunately, from what I understand, we don't have, or there's no... Uh, remaining letters that we can still see nowadays that Milena wrote to Kafka. So it is a bit of a one-way conversation, but uh, yes, let's see what we can find out about these two. So obviously Franz Kafka, he's um, the author of classics like The Trial and The Metamorphosis, and the way he met Milena Yesenska was actually at first through his uh, writing, because she translated some of his texts into Czech. So that's how things sort of started. And although Arabal, you know, in his mini quote says La Mujer de Kafka, Milena actually wasn't Fra uh, Franz Kafka's wife or, or woman. Actually, when they met, she was married, although unhappily to somebody else. But anyway, they meet over this love for literature and uh, through the discussion of the translations, and something develops between these two. So starting in spring 1920, there's just this barrage of letters that goes back and forth between these two, only for things to kind of quieten down again at the end of the year. And then there's only a couple of letters from 1922 and 1923, where you see there's still something, but it's already kind of died down. And it's actually not quite that clear how far this relationship went because most of it really kind of was just about the letters. They did meet a couple of times in person but it's not completely clear how physical uh, or intimate things actually got between these two. It is a bit weird reading, you know, sort of personal letters by somebody. And I know people sometimes say, especially with writers, even when they write diaries or letters, they always already have an audience in mind. But even so, you know, those are kind of very intimate feelings that are kind of exposed in front of you. And I guess it's better than what maybe my generation is going to leave to posterity because it is still, I guess, more fulfilling than like, I don't know, checking out, I don't know, pictures, unsolicited pictures that are being sent around nowadays on Tinder or just, you know, several several hellos, hellos and hellos until somebody re realizes that he's been ghosted. So I never thought I would have this like Kafka and like Tinder dating in one sentence or one paragraph in my mind, but here we are. Anyway, so it is kind of like this weird uh, experience of reading the letters and of course there's lots of like self-doubt and they don't know what to do and there's like I want you, I don't want you, so it's it's just all very tr tragic in a way. Um, there's even like at some point uh, Kafka actually says, you know, um, all the, the, the bad things in my life kind of stem from the fact uh, or stem from letters, or the fact that I can communicate through let letters, all my unhappiness stems just from that. But there's also like other things that are quite interesting in the letters, because of course they talk about their relationship or their connection, but they, Kafka does also talk about other things. And uh, 
at one point he talks about how he's not sure what path he's on or and then he tries to explain to Milena just imagine that every time when you want to go for a walk you know you don't just have to uh, wash yourself and brush your teeth before that which is already you know quite you know a lot to do but before you know going on your walk you also have to like uh, sew your clothing and make your shoes and make your hat and you're not very good at all of these things so finally when you've you know when you've gotten ready and you walk out into the streets you know after about five or six corners everything falls off you and you stand naked in the middle of the road and I was just like what is going on in your head friends <laughs> but I kind of really like this to I don't know, this explanation, because life is like that sometimes, I guess. Like, yeah, just getting up sometimes feels like, I guess, you have to make shoes from scratch. <laughs> so this I really like. So yeah, those are kind of like the, the letters. But there is also a kind of... a deeper or darker connection between those two letters, or between Milena and Fernando Arabal. So Franz Kafka died in 1924, but Milena actually survived him for another 20 years. So during the interwar period, she actually, I believe, joined the Communist Party, and then she wrote for lots of uh, political magazines and journals, and then during the Second World War, she was actually part of the resistance movement in Czechoslovakia. Now, unfortunately, she did get caught in the end and she was brought to the Ravensbrück concentration camp where she also perished. Now, the interesting thing to know about the Ravensbrück concentration camp is that it was really a concentration camp that was for women. And most importantly, especially in the beginning, later, especially at the end of the war, it kind of got mixed up and changed a bit. It was a concentration camp for women from, let's say, the left, like political prisoners and especially like, yeah, women who were fighting in the different resistance movements all across Europe. So this means that actually quite a few Spanish Republican women also ended up in the concentration camps in Ravensbrück and also died there alongside Milena. Because I think um, we always say, you know, Spain was neutral during uh, the Second World War and, well, yes, I guess theoretically that's true, but obviously the thing is a bit more murky. I mean, we do need to remember that, of course, uh, during the Spanish Civil War, Spain was heavily aided by uh, Nazi Germany. I mean, I guess the, the biggest symbol of that, of course, is uh, when the Condor Legion completely annihilated and destroyed the Basque town of Guernica. And also interesting to note, there is actually lots of like uh, Spanish volunteers that came to Germany to fight on the side of the Nazis. And there was actually a big uh, scandal around it, I think in about 2015, when it came out that some of these Spanish volunteers who were fighting on the side of the fascists were actually still being paid out a pension by the German government. Everything is a bit more murky and connected than you might expect in this regard. And yes, so there, there is unfortunately like this deeper darker connection between Arabal and Milena, that they both actually suffered under, uh, under the fascists in different ways or forms. So yeah, this is what a silly, you know, TV show from 1989 brings about in my mind. Having mentioned these two kind of like books, uh, I also want to point you to Elvira Lindo's uh, A Corazón Abierto. So this book is or was and still is a huge success in Spain and in it Elvira Lindo kind of looks at the life of her parents who who lived through the Spanish Civil War and she also kind of recounts you know how their early life looked like and now this is not I don't think it's overtly super political but I do believe it has some similarities with at least some parts of uh, Arabal's letter 
because yes, it starts out kind of during the Spanish Civil War when Elvira Lindo recounts the the early years of her father, and she says that actually, apparently, at first her father believed that his father had died during the Spanish Civil War, so everyone thought he was dead, and then one day he came back, and uh, Elvira's father actually thought that he saw an apparition or a ghost and apparently when his dad came back he lost all his hair um, which was very of course very odd uh, and then it also says how is he's because things were tough obviously after the Spanish Civil War and her father was then kind of sent off away from the family to kind of fend for himself in Madrid in 1939 um, so yeah, I thought there are like these connections. It was a, a little bit a different book from what I expected from like uh, some of the things I heard, but I know that it kind of uh, elicited a lot of like feedback from people in Spain who were reading it because I think especially an older generation because they kind of saw their parents reflected in the parents of Elvira. So yeah. So that's another book you might want to check out. And as for film suggestions, so remember that in Sol Forino 1914 continued, uh, we were talking about the Harki in Algeria and how they were kind of uh, brought to France and put into so-called transit camps. Well, these transit camps actually already existed earlier, like the, the constructions themselves. And Many of them were already used like uh, at the end of the 30s and the beginning of the 40s because that's where Spanish Republicans were put when they were fleeing from, uh, from Franco and kind of like pouring into the south of France. So Joseph is an animated film and it talks about one of these uh, Spanish Republicans uh, who ends up in one of those camps and he he's also an artist and sort of illustrator and in the end he made his way to New York where he lived and worked and yeah Joseph is kind of like a, a story about that. As for musical accompaniment um, I think I'll I'll point you to uh, uh, Rosalia or, well, uh, basically Rosalia did a rendition of um, Me Quedo Contigo, which is actually originally uh, a song by the Chunguitos. And the reason I want to kind of like mention it here is because the Chunguitos are of uh, Romani Spanish descent. And actually, I'm really sorry, I think that's my cat, but we'll just continue. And the, so the Chunguitos are of Romani Spanish um, descent, and actually many Roma Sinti were also hounded down by the Nazis during the Second World War. There was like heavy ethnic cleansing going on, and there was this uh, uh, Roma and Sinti Holocaust actually happening at the same time uh, with everything else uh, during the Second World War. So I kind of thought uh, I'll, I should bring it up here. And. Uh, yeah, so this is why I'll, I'll post in the description box also uh, the original by the Chunguitos and then also like uh, Rosalia's wonderful rendition, which I think she she did a couple of uh, years back at the Goya Awards. So yeah, I think that's pretty much it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.